There have been many iterations of Clayton over the years. Many different versions of myself. Some a little bit stronger. Some a little bit weaker. Two steps forward, one step back in my healing journey. From the spirit world where I watched, I had a moment when I could pick my parents here on Mother Earth. And when I descended down from the spirit world to my mother, Gail Thomas, and my father, Peter Sinclair Sr., my mother at the time was 15 years old, trying to finish her high school diploma. My father was in his 30s. She didn't tell my dad about the pregnancy. The social worker that she talked to about the circumstance, she sent my mom to the home for unwed mothers. And so they put her on a flight to Winnipeg, the city of dirty water. You know, Winnipeg's got the biggest urban population of native people in any city in Canada. It's the biggest urban reserve, as they call it. And you know, and when I hear that, I, I, I think that it's got the biggest potential. Got a lot of bad reputation. It's like stab city, stab peg, racist peg. You know, I love this place though. And I love all the people here, even the people that done me wrong. kindergarten I had a teacher whenever I would make a mistake she would make me stand in the garbage can in the corner of the class and she would get all the kids to stand up and she would say why is Clayton Thomas in the trash can and the whole class would say because Clayton Thomas is garbage there was one other native kid in my class one time he took my dump truck uh, I picked that thing up and I and I and I smashed his head in with it you know, I've been going in and out of therapy since I was in kindergarten. She grabs me by my braids and she bashes my head against the wall. She was killed when I was 15. I beat my dad's sister within an inch of her life with a baseball bat in front of me. He, he took a, a straight razor. Go outside and wash the blood off my brother's car. He was murderers and he had a, a bone protruding out of her shin. And, you know, I ended up getting raped a bunch of times. Message like, I could have killed you in your sleep. I was in preschool. I don't know what happened, but he came crashing into the house and I was watching cartoons and he was banging on the door saying, Gail, you get out here. And my mom, you know, she's like, well, fuck yourself. And I remember he kicked, he just, he punched and he kicked and, and the door just shattered, you know, wood everywhere. And I remember, you know, he's beating my mom on the bed and, and, and I, I, I remember picking up two pieces of wood and I remember I, I walked into the bedroom when he's beating her on the bed and she's screaming and there's blood everywhere. And, and I went, hey, look what I made. It's an airplane so I can fly away from here. And then I went, mm. Clayton Thomas Mueller is a courageous, passionate, socially justice activist committed to ending injustices against the environment and its peoples. It is my great honor to welcome and introduce this year's keynote speaker, 
Clayton Thomas Mueller. In my own life, I remember riding around on dog sleds with my uncle, you know, in northern Manitoba. I remember checking the trap line with my grandpa, you know. I remember going out behind our cabin way up in northern Manitoba and shooting chickens and, you know, making soup with my grandma. Hydroelectric development flooded our homelands. Many of our sacred sites are underneath hydroelectric reservoirs. I ended up living in the city of Winnipeg because, you know, we were dispossessed from our land. And this story is the same story for many indigenous peoples that live here in the cities all across this country. If you take all of the hydroelectric transmission lines, all of the pipelines, all of the mining and gas operations in the tar sands and in the Arctic, and you overlay those maps, Canada's most toxic industries are directly adjacent to indigenous communities. We got to teach humanity how to connect to the sacredness of the place of where they're at. Or they'll continue to be possessed by that spirit of greed and consumption, and fill the emptiness inside with consumerism. And the only way to, to, to fill that void inside of us is by connecting with nature is by connecting with living systems and being a part of that system, understanding your role in that system of life. All those keys. Hola! 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 Well, that's what I said two nights, but... Right. Yeah, yeah. That's not what the Google said. <laughs> what did you know? He knows some Indian stuff. <laughs> yeah. Well, well let I'm me... I'm back let me, inside now. All right, let me do my thing here. I'll call you in a bit. Let me do my thing. Don't go to bed without calling me and saying goodnight. Oh, that's not me, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Love you more. Bye. When the sun comes up in the morning sky, there I will be. There I will be. Soaring with the eagle so high, feeling free. Remember me. I would often go to ceremony and at one of those sweat lodges, we invited some old Anishinaabe lady to come be a part of the sweat. And she came in there and she prayed for me. At the end of that ceremony in the fourth round, she reached out to me and she said, my, my boy, here, here, take this. And she put into my hand a, a, a wood carving. And it was a little black bear, a little black bear. And she said, I see two baby black bears here in the sweat lodge. And they're coming to you and they're gonna help you in your life in ways that you cannot possibly hope to even conceive. 
and I didn't know what she was talking about. And uh, I just, you know, I thanked her. It was a good sweat. And, you know, while I was there, I got a call from back home. Found out that, that we were pregnant. You know, my wife, Corinne, and I. And so when my son, Felix, was born, I took that placenta and I, I put it in a, a container. And the doctors all thought I was strange and I, they wanted to throw it away. And I was like, forget it. You give me that. I got responsibilities with that. And, you know, Jackson came not, not you know, shortly after Felix. And his placenta too. I told the doctors, I want his afterbirth. I had actually procrastinated on doing the ceremony for Felix. And his placenta was in our freezer for, you know, until Jack was born. And it was kind of a running joke for the wife and I, you know, for Corinne and I. Anytime people would come over, they'd be like, what's in there? And we'd have a chuckle and we'd say, oh, that's, the Corinne would say, that's my placenta. <laughs> so, you know, so when Jack was born and I had his placenta and he had come home and I had Felix's placenta in the freezer, I hiked up here with Felix. And I sat him down beside me here in the forest. And, uh, and I lit my pipe. And I put their placentas in the earth together because they're brothers. And I buried it and I made a food offering and a cloth offering for my boys. And I gave thanks because, you know, when I was burying their placenta, I thought way back to that time when that old Ojibwe lady said that two little black bears would come, be coming to help me in my life. To help me in this journey. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> With Donald Trump set to ignore the rights of indigenous peoples and communities. I don't know more along with hundreds of other indigenous communities and organizations. The reference to indigenous rights and human rights have been moved into an annex in the Paris text. What? Every community that I've worked in in the 15 plus years I've been campaigning it's always grandmas and moms. Companies and mining companies that are, you know, wreaking havoc on our traditional territories and on our water. Act on emboldening uh, racists here in Canada, emboldened. We talk about, you know, changing the system and not the climate. In this country, we have to talk about colonization. There is, uh, you know, solidarity and support. Uh, Trying to stop Tarzan's expansion at the source, hunting this barge. All the prayers and love of the people. This is what they telling us in media is selling us. Stories of protectors that are protesting rebellious. Protecting private sector spin the story. It's insidious. Barrels do ahead. They won't be happy till they're rid of us. So how do my only sleep at night? Rolling up and giving light. Post-traumatic stress arrest while violating treaty rights. So tell me how this differs from starving out the West. Moving out the Indians. They never know what's best. Train tracks, they connect me back through space and time to the limited and, and cherished moments I had with my great-grandparents and our family's trap line in northern Manitoba. The only way to get there is by train. They drop you off a mile 112 between the Paw, Manitoba, and Lynn Lake. And you just get off in the bush and you walk down a trail and there's our cabin and it's like our trap line. And uh, I used to go there and stay with my great grandparents, you know, and they were they were very well respected medicine people. When they died, and we lost that connection to our land, and we stopped going up north. You know, I seen the way my family life degraded. My mom started drinking, 
my aunties, they start drinking and, and just shit got, shit got hard. I want to learn all of the things that I wasn't taught when I was a kid. It wasn't until, you know, I became a man that I started to learn how to pick medicines, learn how to hunt fish and trap in a way that asserts our place in the sacred circle of life. I'm so grateful for the privilege I have to be able to go for our annual Brothers Hunt. Thunderchild First Nation is so beautiful. Way up here in northern Saskatchewan, Treaty 6 territory. I often dream about this place and the coolies and the beautiful ridges where you can just see for miles and miles and all of the poplar and the spruce trees and the birch trees. It's an incredible place that provides me the opportunity to give meat to my grandmother, my, my Gigi as she likes to be called, and to feed my sons, Jackson and Felix, wild meat from the land. Having a successful hunt and taking apart the animal, you know, and hanging the, the moose's uh, bell facing north to honor its spirit, its pride. All of these experiences, uh, you know, it's something that you have to do if you grew up in the city. Get out on the land to get your hands, you know, you know, bloody, you know, taking apart an animal. These are the experiences that give you the energy you need to overcome the, uh, the hard times. I was the first in our family to pick up the pipe to go to the Sundance, to go to the sweat. It's our responsibility as pipe carriers to pass on the knowledge that we have to our children, to the young people, to remember the stories, the songs. Life in the City of Dirty Water is my story. It's the story of many Indigenous peoples who find themselves in the inner city with questions. It's the story of how we became dispossessed and how we rise. Sometimes it hurts to be indigenous, born in this nation. Not enough to talk about decolonization. In the battles with myself, I'm continually facing. Feel the stress of the world on my shoulders, I'm fading. But I ain't going out yet, cause this is just the outset. And I ain't making change if I'm rapping about an outfit. Wanna tell me how to live and how to react to devastation of my culture, trying to keep it intact while living on the rules of the Indian Act. Indian agents were just racist, some just stating the facts. They took my identity, I'm taking it back. I am Anishinaabe, I belong to the land. No, they can't silence our song. 